<laughs> Passion, pomp and ceremony, the last night of the proms introduced by James Nocte. <laughs> from the Royal Albert Hall. Welcome back, if you've been with us all along, for the second part of the last night of the proms. This is the most famous classical music festival in the world. You can hear all the cheering here. And this last night is watched by an audience of many, many millions throughout the world. And to all of you, wherever you are, welcome to the Royal Albert Hall. As always, the spine of the season is the BBC's own choirs and orchestras, apart from the audience. Tonight, the BBC Singers and the BBC Symphony Chorus and Orchestra are performing under the orchestra's chief conductor, Andrew Davis. Now, the orchestra's had a very busy year. Tonight's their 13th prom, apart from anything else, and they've recently made their debut at the Salzburg Festival. They performed Britain's War Requiem there, and they're planning an extended North American tour next spring. Now, for the second year, we're joined tonight by thousands of people across the road in Hyde Park. They're watching on giant video screens, and we think there are 40,000 of them. So we go over now to Terry Wogan, who's been introducing proms in the park for the audience there. Terry, how's it all been going outside? Thank you, Jim. It hasn't been going badly. On behalf of Radio 2, we say good evening to Radio 3 and to viewers of BBC One Television. I think we should have an enormous cheer from everyone here in the park so you can hear what 40,000 people sound like. Now, well, put down the vin du pay and the chicken legs and the volavants and let's have a proper cheer. Joy is definitely unconfined in Hyde Park tonight. Now, not long ago, all of us in the park and on Radio 2 had the sheer pleasure and delight of watching and listening to the fabulous River Dance Company. And we'd like to share part of that with our friends on Radio 3 and BBC One Television. River dance from Hyde Park. Well, we'll be going back to the park and Terry later in the program. Here in the Royal Albert Hall, the second half's going to begin with a traditional ceremony. Here now are two promenaders, Robin Armand and Stephen Follows. And on behalf of everyone, all the people who come here night after night to stand or sit in the arena in the gallery high above us, they're going to place a wreath, or a chaplet to be more accurate, on the bust of Sir Henry Wood, founder of the proms, whose vision you remember, and this is very important, music for the people at a price the people can afford, and that is the continuing purpose of the promenade concert. He gets a last polish, got some dust from the high reaches landing on him, apparently. Well, it's placed here, that bust, at the start of the season, and he's looked down on all the proms at the Royal Albert Hall. Surely would have approved with that great crowd down there giving him three hearty cheers. Now, first tonight, we're going to see here one of the most celebrated of all pieces of American music. It's Aaron Copland's rather stirring fanfare for the common man. It was written in 1942. It's scored for brass and percussion. And Andrew Davis returns to set the second half going with the BBC Symphony Orchestra and the audience with fanfare for the common man.
and percussion of the BBC Symphony Orchestra conducted by Andrew Davis in Fanfare for the Common Man by Aaron Copeland. He's now going to conduct the whole orchestra in Jupiter, the bringer of jollity from Gustav Holt's suite, The Planets, and of course the tune in the central section will be familiar to you as the hymn, I Vow to Be My Country.
Jupiter from Gustav Holt's Planet Suite, included late in this proms program as a memory of Diana, Princess of Wales, whose favourite hymn it was. I vow to thee my country played, of course, at her funeral. And incidentally, the promenaders who take a charity collection every night down in the arena have raised more than £3,000 for the memorial fund, as well as more than £5,000 over the season for the Malcolm Sargent Cancer Fund for Children Scotland and uh, the Musicians Benevolent Fund and indeed the Association of British Youth Clubs. The next piece tonight is the variations on I Got Rhythm, George Gershwin's last major work, most of it written in Palm Beach in 1933. Gershwin said this, playing my songs as frequently as I do at private parties, I've naturally been led to compose numerous variations upon them and to indulge the desire for complication and variety. Every composer feels like this when he manipulates the same material over and over again. Well, I Got Rhythm is one of the... If you wonder why they're shouting there, it's because they're, they think it's always funny to say heave when a piano is moved. <laughs> They've been doing it for years and they won't stop. But anyway, it's one of Gershwin's most popular melodies, I Got Rhythm. Of course, it's from the 1930 show Girl Crazy. That star Ginger Rogers. And the audience in Hyde Park and on Radio 2 heard the overture earlier this evening. The lyrics of Girl Crazy were by Ira Gershwin, and it was one of the songs with which the singer Ethel Merman took the American theatre by storm. It's also been sung by many Hollywood stars, Judy Garland and Gene Kelly among them. The variations were written specifically for the Leo Reisman Orchestra, which was Gershwin's touring ensemble, and they were all designed to show off Gershwin himself at the piano. There are six of the variations. They include a valse triste, a Chinese variation, and one in jazz style. Now, in these touring programmes with the Reisman Band, audiences not only got a generous sampling of Gershwin music, generally an American in Paris and some famous show tunes, but they also saw the composer himself almost continuously in action on stage as the soloist in the variations in the Rhapsody in Blue and the Concerto in F. Davis with tonight's soloist Wayne Marshall, who performed on the Royal Albert Hall organ in the first half and now moves to the piano to perform George Gashwin's variations on I Got Rhythm.
Great cheer for Wayne Marshall to have playing George Gershwin's variations and I got rhythm. Could Gershwin have played it better? Wayne Marshall, who is uh, organist in residence at the uh, in residence at the beautiful Bridgewater Hall in Manchester, where apart from anything else, he does a vast amount of work with young people. Equally accomplished on piano and organ, as those of you who saw the first half of playing Messiaen on this great. 
machine high above the stage, and he returns now to accept the cheers. He's going to get some flowers, I think. Well, indeed, he's getting a bottle. It looks like a bottle, very suspicious shape. Looked like a sheep that uh, was around there as well, and a lovely bouquet. There's a sheep. Being waved for some unaccountable reason. And Wayne Marshall slips off the stage after that wonderful performance of Gershwin. Not surprisingly. Back he comes, being applauded by the BBC Symphony Orchestra. The noise around me is getting louder and louder. And as we know, that will be the pattern for the rest of this evening. And while the platform is being rearranged uh, here in the Royal Albert Hall, we're going to go over the road to the vast crowd in the park and our host there, Terry Wogan. Terry. Thank you, Jim. We thought you'd never come. An enormously warm welcome for all of us in the park and on Radio 2. We welcome listeners to Radio 3 and viewers to BBC One Television. When I say warm, I say with a certain artistic licence. There's a gentle zephyr stirring the leaves of the old oak trees around Hyde Park, but it takes more than that to dampen the spirits of the 40,000 people who are gathered here vociferously, and probably the worst for drink, enjoying proms in the park. They're in the best of spirits, musically and, and spiritually. Uh, many of them brought food and wine, very few have offered me any. We're enjoying a picnic as well as a, a prom in the park. Candles and lanterns flicker in the gloaming here. And later on, we're all going to be really lit up because the fireworks will be lighting up the serpentine just behind us. A wonderful evening. I hope we're helping you to share it, those of you who are watching and listening at home. Now, to matters musical. The word crossover is one too often used, perhaps both in popular as well as classical music. But an artist who epitomizes the word is our guest. John Williams has always been at the top of the tree. He's one of the most distinguished guitarists in the world. He's going to play a piece written by a Spanish composer, Francisco Tariega, who was one of the most distinguished guitarists of his time. And one of Tariega's most delightful pieces is, is a miniature, small but beautifully formed, not unlike James Nochte. It's Recuerdos de la Alhambra. So, you spoil me. With memories of the Alhambra, we welcome the great John Williams.
A wonderful scene out there in the park. John Williams performing Memories of the Alhambra. And so now to our next piece this evening, back inside Britain's Irish Reel. Very appropriate for us since we've had River Dance a little earlier, not to mention Sir Terence himself. Now, the Irish Reel was written by Benjamin Britten in 1936. I don't know if you can hear it, but they're all singing here. Goodness knows what. But anyway, <laughs> Britain's Irish Reel was written as the title music for a documentary film. I'm trying to find out what they're cheering about. But... Someone did something, but it's the kind of thing that happens. As, as I was saying before I was interrupted by about 6,000 people, Benjamin Britten wrote it as the title music for a documentary which was called Around the Village Green. Now, Britten subsequently withdrew the score, wasn't heard again until the 1995 Alborough Festival, and it's never been heard in circumstances like this before. As Andrew Davis emerges once more to conduct Benjamin Britten's Irish Reel. Benjamin Britten's Irish Reel, played by the BBC Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Andrew Davis, with a few people bouncing up and down, and as usual, not in time, but there we are, that's what happens. Now next we're going to hear an aria from Weber's romantic opera, Der Freischutz, which is sung by Anne Evans. It's night time in the opera, and the heroine, Agatha, is waiting her for her fiancé, Max. He's been taking part in a shooting competition. And at this point, she sings of her joyful anticipation. Let my pure song float gently up to the stars, she says. And the resplendent figure of Anne Evans bows to her audience and prepares to be Agatha from their fry shoots.
from Die Freischutz by Weber and Evans was the soloist with the BBC Symphony Orchestra under Andrew Davis who joins in the applause for one of our great sopranos celebrated around the world for many years I was about to say a great Wagnerian and on cue, on she comes with an extremely long spear and a winged helmet. of a great Wagnerian. That was Anne Evans, alias Brunhilde, from Act Two of Wagner's Die Valkyrie. With only one adjustment of the helmet in the middle, Brunhilde's great war cry rang out to the highest reaches of the helmet hall, accompanied by a splendid silver spear. They want more of Brunhilde, but I mean, if she carried on, we'd be here for several hours. <laughs> Brunhilde has a long way to go from those sounds before the end of the ring. So Anne Evans holding her helmet very gracefully before it falls off, disappears for the moment though we will see her back ere uh, long. And now, to the sound of a few whistles, we have reached the traditional finale to the last night of the proms. 
Uh, most of the promenaders here in the hall, down on the floor and up in the gallery have been regulars throughout the season. Some of them have been here indeed every night for the 73 concerts that have stretched over eight weeks. And this year they're joined again by the thousands of people, 40,000 of them across the road in Hyde Park. There are two choirs on stage in the park to help all the singing along, the Croydon Philharmonic Chorus and the Bristol Choral Society. And the singing in the hall will be led as ever by the wonderful BBC singers and the BBC Symphony Chorus. And this is the point where we all come together. The hall, the park, BBC One, Radio 3, Radio 2, and the television and radio audience throughout the world. Andrew Davis is going to be conducting everyone. Thanks to the big screens in Hyde Park, everyone will see his beat. And without getting too carried away, despite the bubbles that are falling all over me, that sense of coming together really is the point of the proms. Concerts that are accessible to large numbers of people in this huge arena that holds thousands, where you can turn up and get in, and very cheaply, year in and year out, the summer of concerts attracts a very diverse audience in an atmosphere that really is informal. You can wear anything you like, and where there is only one rule, listen to the music. The programmes are sometimes familiar and sometimes very adventurous. The Proms has innovation as one of its proudest boasts. <laughs> and apart from the special atmosphere of the last night, I was just getting rid of a ribbon there, where traditionally almost anything goes, the concerts do create a mood that is recognisably their own. It is a mixture of seriousness, which is respect for performers and composers, and great relaxation. There's nothing really quite like the Albert Hall in these summer months. Here he comes. Andrew Davis prepares for the long last lap.
Well, you didn't need me to tell you that was Elgar's pomp and circumstance march number one with Land of Hope and Glory, accompanied by all sorts of flags, Greek flags, United Nations flags, European Union flags, as well as the Union Jack, some post-devolution saltars, Irish flags, red dragons for Anne Evans, people in the Albert Hall, 40,000 or so in Hyde Park, singing along to Andrew Davis's beat, relayed outside on the giant screen, the land of hope and glory from Elgar's Pomp and Circumstance number one. And we're now going to have Sir Henry Wood's Fantasia on British Sea Songs, another ever-present feature. Very good voice this year.
Yeah, you were doing rather well there. Until the end, but we ignored you anyway.
with Rule Britannia, preceded, of course, by the familiar Fantasia and British Sea Songs, which is Sir Henry Wood's own contribution to the last night of the proms. Listen, if you know, you know they're renovating. <laughs> He's trying Get to speak. away from me. You know, they're, re they're renovating this hall next year, so let's try and take the roof off, shall we? <laughs>
a sound, not only here in the Royal Albert Hall, but in the park across the road, no doubt the voice of Mr Wogan among them. Anne Evans with Rule Britannia and the BBC Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Andrew Davis. Who gets, well, he's getting a bottle as well. And a bunch of flowers. Lovely bouquets coming on. For the much loved Ann Evans. And we're going to get Andrew Davis's speech, which he cares a great deal about. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the end of another great season is now almost upon us. But well, all good things come to an end. As we celebrate here in the wonderful Royal Albert Hall, millions join us all over the world through the magic media of radio and television, and, good heavens, there are 35,000 people just across the way in Hyde Park. And <laughs> I think we should give them a little encouraging shout. So do you want uh, just a little hello park? Ready? Yes. Hello park. <laughs> hear you over there. Can you do a little better? obscure that one uh, <laughs> it's it's really been a wonderful season full of adventure the very much this year for instance we've heard music by 34 living composers many of them were premieres and a huge wealth of music new to the proms the average attendance this year was an astonishing 88.4 percent and with the increase to 73 concerts over a quarter of a million tickets were sold <laughs> And I'd like to salute the architect of such an enormous triumph, the director of the proms, Mr. Nicholas Kenyon. <laughs> this is the 103rd season since Sir Henry Wood started this great enterprise. But it might have collapsed in 1927 were it not for the BBC. Now, the BBC is itself 75 years old this year. <laughs> yes. So, Audrey's got a way to catch up yet. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I'd like to combine our traditional three cheers for the founder with a birthday salute to the corporation. So, let's hear it for Sir Henry and the BBC. Hip, hip! <laughs> take out insurance for this. Uh... I'd, I'd like to thank our soloists tonight, first of all, our two wonderful soloists, Wayne Marshall and Anne Evans. The other people behind me here, as usual, all performed brilliantly throughout the season. And first of all, let's salute the incomparable BBC singers. <laughs> Next.
next, um, as usual, perfectly prepared by their ace chorus master, Stephen Jackson, who I think should take a bow by himself right now, Stephen. <laughs> the fabulous BBC Symphony Chorus. <laughs> you know, you know what I didn't do tonight? It's terrible, isn't it? I didn't give the, all the soloists vows after the sea song. Well, I know. I don't know. I might get fired for this sort of thing, you know. So let's do it now. So let's have the one by one. Yeah. So, this is my own special boys and girls here. <laughs> BBC Symphony Orchestra played one concert fewer than usual this year since Mr. Kenyon very kindly let us out. <laughs> Towards the end of August, while you were making merry here, we played two concerts in the Salzburg Festival, including a very moving performance, I must say, of the War Requiem. So, thank you, Nick, for letting us fly the flag in the birthplace of the great Wolfgang Amadeus. <laughs> oh, there he is. He's where is he? <laughs> Yes, I, we have met, actually, yeah. <laughs> For two gentlemen here tonight, this will be the last, last night. Arthur Price, who is... Who is... <laughs> That's enough from the paid clack. <laughs> uh, who's leading the second violins, has been in our orchestra since 1986, but he's played in a variety of BBC orchestras since the early 1960s. David Butt, who you just applauded already. Yeah. <laughs> uh, our principal flute has been dazzling us with his virtuosity, his poetry, and his just plain, downright, out and out class. <laughs> class, that's what I <laughs> For 38 years. <laughs> We wish them many years of happiness and fulfilment, and we'll miss them very much. So, uh, just take a little bow, would you, gentlemen, please? Uh... <laughs> and speaking of happiness and fulfilment, that is what I constantly enjoy with beautiful people of the great, the good, the stunning, BBC Symphony Orchestra, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> During the last two weeks, we've all lived under the burden of tragedy and loss. Seldom, if ever, has such devastation and grief been felt by so many as at the death of Diana, mourned as the much-loved princess, as the indefatigable champion of the sick and the victims of poverty and war, and especially, let us remember, as the mother of their royal highnesses, the princes William and Henry. Music, I believe, has proved a powerful force in this time. At the funeral service, music gave a focus to our emotions, and perhaps, as the voices of Purcell, Verdi, Holst, John Taverner, and Elton John spoke to us, brought prospect of healing a little closer. Music has lost one of its giants, Sir George, Sir George Schulte. He was 84 years of age, and yet his passing was a shock, since with his great passion and energy, 
he always somehow gave the irresistible impression of immortality. <laughs> to his family, we all, I'm sure, send our deepest sympathy. Yeah. Mother Teresa, too, one of our history's great caring souls, has left a tremendous void and India's state funeral today has clearly demonstrated what a vast difference she made to a city, a country, and far beyond. What all these three people had in common was that they all in their own ways reached out to embrace the world and made it an immeasurably greater place for all of us. We need to seize their legacy and make it truly our own to take their spirit with us into the future, cherishing our common humanity, fulfilling the obligations of our dependence upon one another, vowing, in the words of William Blake's strange and beautiful allegory of spiritual renewal, I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. Jerusalem, a great hymn to social justice and, as Andrew Davis put it, common humanity, bringing to an end.
fireworks over the Serpentine Lake between the crowd in the park and the Royal Albert Hall here. We come to the end of the 103rd season of the BBC Proms, the world's greatest music festival. It really is a unique event, never losing its excitement and its emotion. The cheering continues here and over in the park. The season starts next year on the 17th of July, so I hope you'll be joining us then. But for now, from me, James Nocte, and all of us here in the Royal Albert Hall and in Hyde Park, good night. He's on the move. A spotless train arrives at a spotless platform, spot on time. But in the land of the rising sun... By dressing as English punks or American rockers, these young Japanese can be outrageous and blame it on somebody else. Things aren't always what they seem. See, I'm in Holland, but I'm also in Japan. Four million Japanese come here every year to see what life in Europe is really like. Full Circle with Michael Palin continues tomorrow at 8 on BBC One. Featuring Newcastle United versus Wimbledon, plus all the day's action from the Premiership. Match of the day is in 20 minutes. First on BBC One, a little later than scheduled, the day's news and sport with Peter Sissons. The government is warned of a showdown with Britain's teachers if it tries to freeze their pay. One teacher's leader says industrial action can't be ruled out if teachers are pushed down again. The Ulster Unionists edge closer to joining Monday's peace talks. They'll decide on the day. And a state funeral in Calcutta for Mother Teresa, already a saint to the poor. Good evening. A teacher's leader has warned of an explosion of anger among the profession if the government attempts to freeze teachers' pay. Nigel de Grucci of the second largest teaching union said there could be industrial action by teachers in response. His comments follow growing speculation that ministers intend to be as strict as the last Tory government on public sector pay, dashing the hopes of millions of workers. Our political correspondent David Walter reports. Good luck. Teachers are bracing themselves for their pay effectively to be frozen, with any rise limited to the rate of inflation. It'll be the fifth year running that's happened, and they find it particularly hard to take from a Labour government committed to education as its first priority. Sooner or later, there's bound to be an explosion of anger amongst teachers. At some stage in the future, some kind of industrial action can't be ruled out if teachers are going to be pushed down year after year. According to its critics, the government shouldn't be setting strict pay limits before its own review bodies had its say. That would look, they claim, like a slap in the face for its members. They're considering at the moment evidence from teachers at a time when 15,000 teachers have left the profession this year, when we've got 1,000 head teachers short in our schools at the present time, and when the number of people coming forward for teaching is on the decline. But according to the government supporters, low pay isn't the main... More money has been promised for education, but it shouldn't go on teachers' pay. I think parents and children would be probably quite angry if the extra money that the government has found is eaten up in improving the pay of existing teachers. We want more teachers in the classroom, reduced class sizes, more library books, better uh, information technology, and we want to improve the quality of our school buildings. That's where the money should go. Doctors are in the same position as the teachers. They, too, are indignant at suggestions that their pay should be frozen. They're expected next week to put in a claim for a rise of around 50%. The nurses have already claimed 20%.
Nobody at the moment suggesting that the new Labour government's heading for the sort of winter of discontent which finished off the last one.